Hi, my name is Will Chandler, and I am the program director of the Young Artists and Writers Project at the Stony Brook University Southampton campus. And this week, I have had the pleasure of working with these young writers um, who have been amazing. And we have, uh, they have each walked through um, exercises and, and written examples in fiction, in poetry, in personal narrative, and in dialogue. And the, uh, the level of work this week has just been exceptional. And I could not, uh, it was just a tremendous joy to work with each one of them. Um, we have, uh, today we'll be presenting uh, eight young voices um, with each, and each one has something to say. And so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first reader. Our first reader is Izzy Kaplan. Hi, today I'll be reading um, an excerpt from my currently untitled short story. It was the day my grandmother exploded. Well, she didn't really explode, but that was just one of the many crazy ideas my younger sister and I came up with for why she just disappeared on my birthday a few years ago. Some of our other ideas were sinking into quicksand, getting abducted by the family of hawks that were always flying around, and getting granny napped by a bunch of tree nymphs. No matter what was the cause, we were left without anyone to care for us at the ages of just four and eight. We were placed in a few foster cares over the years, but it was difficult to come across anyone that wanted to adopt two children that weren't babies. One and a half years ago, we were adopted, but it's been a rough transition, for me at least. To be honest, it's surprising how close the truth some of our ideas ended up being. But that was a long time ago. Now my sister Madison is eight and I'm almost 13. And although we knew our grandmother didn't really explode at the time, those were just some of the truths we used so we wouldn't have to wonder about why she would leave us. Were we really that much of a burden? We live in a town that is about an hour from where we used to live with our grandmother. We used to live in a cottage that always felt like home. Now we live in a much larger house with two layers, but it doesn't feel like home to me, and I worry it never will. We do live within walking distance from the beach, which is really nice. Madison and I share a bunk bed, and I'm on the top because Madison's scared of falling off. I'm scared of heights, but I would do anything for her. Melody, will you tell me the story grandmother used to tell us? Madison asked me. She asks it at least once a week at bedtime, and every time I hear her ask it, it breaks my heart. Of course, Maddie, I tell her, laying next to her in bed. Once upon a time, the world was filled with wonders beyond your greatest dreams. Majestic unicorns wandered the earth, and pixies flitted in the trees. Mermaids filled the bays, and trolls guarded bridges. All evil could be conquered by good, until one day when an evil wizard formed an army of trolls and ogres and had them fight for him. He wanted to be the only creature with magic and rule over everyone forever. He used his magic to make himself immortal and spent years killing everything with magic or taking away their magic when he could. He still spends his days destroying everything once magical. But if you look hard enough, magic still lies within all of us. Unicorns still hide in caves and pixies still cower in trees, but they cannot be as they once were. You must look and help the magic live again. I leaned down and gave her a kiss on her forehead and climbed the ladder to my bed. I used a book like to read a novel. I checked out the library this week, but I couldn't read with all the thoughts swirling in my head. I decided to just try to go to sleep because I knew it would take a while for rest to find me. It was obvious that Madison wasn't ready to believe grandmother didn't leave us on purpose. Should I believe that too? Okay. Thank you, Izzy. And our next reader is Ayla Weiss. I'm reading from a currently entitled work in progress. When my family moved to a new house in the same area, it became impossible to continue living life the same way I had before. When I came back from school, it didn't feel like I was coming home. There was a porch on the new house and I would trip on the steps leading up to it. The unfamiliar door opened in instead of out, so that I often found myself unconsciously pulling at the handle, wondering why it wouldn't open. And when I stepped inside the place, I would turn to the left, where in my old home, there was a coat closet, but in this house, I was left staring at an empty wall. I pulled my sneakers off and left them by the door before heading towards the kitchen to find something to eat. Our old wooden table that we had decided to keep in the move looked strangely out of place in the far more modern kitchen in this house. However, one of the most annoying changes was that I had no idea where any of the dishes were stored. 
I started pulling open cabinets at random and finding pots and pans and wine glasses instead of plates. Suddenly, I heard a loud voice yelling, I'm home. It was the voice of my younger brother, whose school led out a little after mine. I heard quick footsteps thudding on the wooden floor, and then the boy himself came racing into the kitchen. Why are all the cabinets open? He asked as he caught his breath. Sorry, I replied. I just forgot where the plates were. Can you help me look? Immediately, he walked over to a not yet open cabinet and opened it to reveal stacks of plates. Sighing, he turned and looked at me. Come on, we've lived here a whole week now. Can't you at least remember this much? He scolded, as if a week was practically all the time in the world. Well, I thought if my brother could get used to our new home this fast, I probably will soon too. Okay, thank you, Ayla. And our next, uh, our next reader is Melanie Huang. I will be reading a currently untitled short story. I walked toward the familiar intersection, not a block from my house. I just finished my first semester of college and was walking home from the bus stop. I couldn't wait to stick my key into the lock on the door, enter my familiar house, see familiar faces, and lay on the familiar couch. I could see the blinking red hand on the streetlight, but I wanted to get home quickly. Without checking for cars, I decided to cross the street. Out of the corner of my eye, a huge brown UPS truck turned the corner and charged at me, also trying to make the light. I saw spots, and then I saw darkness. Slowly, the darkness turned to light. I was in a supermarket with my mom and younger brother. My brother looked like he was two, but he's 12 now. I was shorter and couldn't move on my own. I was trapped in my previous self, reliving this memory. I was forced to walk down the candy aisle and find a Hershey's milk chocolate bar, my favorite. I would have and should have asked my mom to buy it for me, but I thought I knew she would say no, so I put it back. Meanwhile, my brother got all the toys he pointed at. Why didn't I just get that chocolate bar? I didn't even ask. The supermarket faded to blackness and our living room appeared. I had one of my middle school best friends over for a sleepover, and she was begging me to try a face mask. I tried with all my might to grab that face mask, but of course it didn't work. Next, I was outside the high school, right after dismissal. My friends wanted me to go to the mall with them. I told them I was sick because I didn't know what store they'd go into or what they'd buy. I thought they would judge me. I could then hear sirens screaming, getting louder and louder the quick footsteps around me, the voices shouting my name, and then it was dark again. It was white, so blindingly white. I blinked rapidly, trying to gain awareness of my surroundings. What happened? Why was I here? The doctors told me everything. I was brought to the hospital after being hit by a UPS truck. The driver called the ambulance. My parents had friends. My parents and friends were waiting outside in the waiting room. Friends? I had friends? I thought I'd ruined all my friendships. So you see, people did care about me. They waited five whole days for me to wake up. My mother bought tons of Hershey's chocolate bars. My middle school friend got face masks. And my high school friends gave me gift cards to clothing stores. But just go for the things you are uncomfortable with, or you will regret it and it will come back to haunt you. Thank you, Melody. Our next reader is Faith Dugal. Um, hello, I'm, re I'm reading three poems today. First, The Endeavor. I write this sitting in the, in the kitchen sink. I write this searching for the missing link. All the places you go and the things you know are the tip of the iceberg called unknown. And what goes on there? No one knows. Staying in the Ritz, we wondered if it was it. Trapped like an almond in a chocolate bar, we waited for the ice to melt and enable us to go far. Shackleton called us to venture to parts unknown, mapping the Arctic tundra, truly a fool's goal. But now in the ice we are trapped, 
survival our new ghoul. Shall we ever make it home, or will we die in the cold, cruel unknown? And next, this one's un untitled, when it's, when it's dark, light breaks apart, candles weak beacons against night's gloom, each dead light, an aching cavern, when the sun rests in bed. In the dark, the unnerving rains, superstitions that don't survive today. Hiding with blankets and many lights as the witching hour passes tonight. Scary stories often told frightened children, maybe to continue to some adults. Parents can chase the shadows away, but big, but big kids aren't babies, right? Sneaking to read stories they regret, watching movies without mandated safety nets. And then the last, my last poem is also entitled, Making a box for one lost, a little girl searching her room for toys and pennies to give, trying to help as kindergartners do, a loss she cannot truly understand. Excitement turns sadness and juvenile determination, a feel better gift put together with a used box and knickknacks. Was it sent? I don't know. Parental request can sometimes be ignored. A cousin lost before even known, gone too fast from our world. An only child gone from earth, childish determination once sought to make. A box to give those alone, with an empty nursery and cradle, where the child was to go. Thank you, Faith. Thank you, Faith. Uh, our next reader is Farah Park. Hi, so I'll be reading my personal narrative titled, Of Course You Won't Believe Me. The summer of when I was five or six years old, we were driving to an Italian restaurant. It was hot, so the windows were rolled down. And ever since I was little, I got very car sick. So I always liked looking out the window. On the way there, I saw a dog sticking its head out the window. So I kept that in my head because I hadn't seen many dogs sticking their heads out the window because I was only five or six. Once we arrived at our destination, I stuck my head out of the window, not like a dog, but like a giraffe. So my neck was basically out of the window too. I knew I would be safe because the car was parked. My parents didn't even know I was doing that. They were just getting ready to leave the car and go to the restaurant. So my brother and dad go out to start ordering. So then of course, my mom starts rolling up the windows and I didn't know she was rolling them up. So eventually I felt myself moving upwards without control. And now I was in between the top of the door and the window squeezing up against my neck. I thought my vein was going to. I was trying to tell my mom that I'm kind of stuck, but no words came out and I was short of breath. So then they're leaving to the restaurant and I look like an animal from a petting zoo trying to escape its cage. I needed to get out, so I twisted my head horizontally and squeezed myself out. And of course, when that happened, my mom turned around and said, oh, I forgot my phone. And she also says, Vera, why aren't you coming? And I tell her how I was choking to death, but being a typical mom she is, she says she's happy that I'm creative and a wild thinker. And of course, she decides not to believe me to this day. Thank you, Farah. Um, our next reader is Catherine Kelton. I'm going to be reading a currently untitled excerpt. It was the day my grandmother exploded and it was all my fault. My parents drove me to the next town over to stay with her for two weeks. They told me they had business overseas. Once I arrived at the cheerful yellow home with the brick pathway up to the front door, I'd expect that inside would be as colorful as the outside, but I couldn't be more wrong. I stepped out of my car and pulled the latch to the trunk up. It creaked open slowly. I pulled out my large red tattered duffel bag and strode down the path and up the steps to the house. I pushed the doorbell and pressed my ear to the door to hear the bang, but the only noise that followed was the sound of the car as my parents sped off. Slightly confused, I rang the button again and nothing. It's broken, I murmured. I knocked the door. This time, I heard a speedy shuffle of feet coming towards me. I put on my most welcoming spot, smile as the door squeaked open. What I assumed was my grandma snuck a quick peek from the slight open gap, 
that was ajar. She couldn't have forgot I was coming, I thought, and the door swung open. I was filled with relief, but only until I saw the appearance of my grandmother. Her wrinkles seemed twice as intense from when I saw her last. Her hair was matted as though she had forgotten to shower. Her skin was as white as the cat I remember her having. I wasn't going to mention this either, but the whole place reeked of something dead. But I tried to hold in my shock and keep my smile plastered on my face. Grandma? I asked as a part question, part exclamation. Her face was still lacking emotion when I heard her meek voice. Kit, come on in. How odd, I thought. My name isn't Kit. It was my mother's. It's Melanie, Kit's daughter, I explained as I looked into her eyes, which was the only thing that remained the same. They glistened from the shadows of the grim interior of her home. How I wish my mother had passed on her eyes to me. Melly, of course, she said, looking me up and down, scanning me. I hated my new nickname she gave me, but I never corrected her to call me by my full name. As I stepped through the barrier into her dark home, I had wished my parents would have just called my neighbor Patty to babysit. She ushered me into her living room. There were cushions scattered on the floor, cans on her coffee table, and the carpet. There was a very old looking TV tipped on its side. She grabbed a cushion right in the entrance of the room, dusted it with her wrinkly hands. She placed it back where it belonged, gesturing for me to take a seat. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Um, our next reader is Margot Vasilescu. Hi, I'll be reading a currently untitled personal narrative. Growing up, I always thought that life would be the same for every kid. When you were a baby, the only way of communicating would be from hand gestures and loud noises you would make to get your parents' attention. You would start crying if, some, if something was uncomfortable or if you wanted something. Eventually, you would begin to grow up, learning new words, how to read, how to play, and do things like sports or building Legos. Or at least that's what I, that's what I expected would happen. However, as life is, what's expected is the unexpected. My childhood was most likely a little bit different from others. I grew up with a brother who was 14 months older than me. But my brother was different. He was diagnosed with autism from an early age. As a typical baby, I wasn't aware that my brother was special. It wasn't a topic my parents could discuss with me because there was no way of translating it in baby language. Additionally, at the time, Autism was still being researched about by doctors and was relatively new. It wasn't until I was two or three years old when I started noticing the changes in my life. As a baby, I loved to seek attention. I did it in any way possible. My mom is always telling me stories of how much trouble I would create. But when I started transitioning into a toddler, all of, my attention was, all of the attention was focused on my brother, and I still couldn't understand why. It was not until my later years when my mom told me that my brother had such severe autism that for long periods of time, he would not speak. When someone would try to play with him, he would just stare back, his eyes empty of emotion. When my parents threw a ball at him once, he just stood there like nothing happened. As my parents would be, as any parent would be, they were very worried for my brother and hired many therapists and counselors to help my brother. Every day, therapists would come to my home many times to work with my brother, and I was always there to witness all the chaos in my home. But as time went on, I was able to adjust and learn that my support was needed for my brother. Sometimes I would tag along and go with my brother to the playground. Over time, I was able to understand my brother's condition and care for him. Throughout elementary school, I was often put in the ICT classes before I, because I understood how to behave and act around kids who were special needs. I have noticed that many people perceive kids with special needs as strange and weird, but deep down they are special for a reason. They are special because they are kind, caring, and some of the smartest people I have ever met. Today my brother and I do everything together. My brother loves to talk to people about world politics and science. He plays sports like baseball, soccer, and competitive tennis. My brother was voted MVP for his baseball team one year, and we have played many doubles matches together. I am very proud of how far my brother has come and grateful for everything my parents have done for my brother to tackle his struggles. Thank you, Margo. 
Um, our next reader, our final reader, is Demi Chudley. I'm reading from an untitled personal narrative. Being the new kid isn't fun. By the beginning of eighth grade, I had heard this refrain a lot from books and movies and even more books. I also knew it as a fact from switching schools in third grade. It turns out there's a big difference from switching schools in third grade and switching schools in eighth. For one, it's a lot easier to make friends in third grade. It's not easy. I still have vivid memories of overdramatic fights between eight-year-olds, but it's easier. It was also probably easier to switch in third grade because I knew I was staying at that school. Being forced to switch schools in eighth grade, knowing you'll probably switch again the very next year, is kind of terrifying. It also gives you a weird sense not to put down roots. I switched to Sacred Heart and, like every new kid eventually does, made friends. But I was almost hesitant to really entrench myself there. I knew I probably wouldn't be there next year. And, as I had just learned, it's hard to keep friends when switching schools. I was fighting to keep my friends of five years as we spread to different schools across the city. I didn't think that these new friendships of less than a year would hold up, especially when the rest of them would be staying together for high school. Sacred Heart has a high school that they were all going to, but I couldn't. So, while eighth grade was filled with visits to the high school building and preparation for the new teachers, I was filled with the feeling that this was all coming to an end. In an odd way, I understood book characters, like Alice in Wonderland or Lucy going into Narnia, Harry going to Hogwarts, a little better. Sacred Heart was so different from any school I had ever been to. It was huge and had all of this fancy technology and these beautiful buildings. It felt like I was adventuring in a new world, plagued by the knowledge that I would eventually have to return back to Earth. And then the pandemic started, and school ended early. I still had online classes, but it wasn't quite the same. In a way, I was almost relieved. It felt like ripping the band-aid off. After all the anticipation of the end, it had finally come, if a little different than expected. Now, I'm going to Dominican Academy in the fall, and I'm really excited. At least now I have experience being the new kid that I doubt my classmates will but it'll be hard to ever forget my year in Wonderland. Thank you, Demi. Um, and thank every, each and every one of you. You did a wonderful, a wonderful work this week. You were just a, a pleasure to be with, um, just really outstanding writers all with wonderful, unique voices, which I, um, I hope that, and I encourage you to keep developing and using uh, because we all of us need to hear what you have to say. I'd also like to say uh, a brief thank you to the MFA in Creative Writing and Literature Department at Stony Brook University at the Southampton campus for hosting us and for making this program possible. Thank you very much.